Good evening, everyone, and welcome to BT's Fly Tying Friday. Tonight, the 15th of March, you'll be stuck with me, Al Beattie, and I'll be tying a muddle may. And the weekly tip, Gary Begley has stepped forward, and he's going to tell us about the tri-tips. And no, we're not talking about barbecue either, but we'll get to that later. I'm Al Beattie from Boise, Idaho, and tonight we're going to be tying a fly that I developed back in 1985, and it's taken, it probably took 10 years for it to become the one that you're going to see tonight through a whole lot of different variations and things that I had to do to it. But let's start with a recipe of the fly. Well, in fact, wait a minute, let's take a look at the fly and the vise. There is a size 12 in the vise, and hanging from it is an 18 that I, that I tied just so you kind of get a general sense of, of what it is. It's a dry fly, imitates a mayfly, um, done, and, um, well, Anyway, we'll see how it goes together. But let's let's get to the recipe. And the recipe here is a dry fly hook, 8 to 18, uh, whatever you want it to be, because this is more of a concept fly like a lot of the flies that Gretchen and I tie. All you got to do is change sizes and colors to make it fit PMDs, blue winged olives, whatever you want it to do for you. But anyway, it's um, I'm going to be tying with gray thread tonight, moose for the tail. The hackle will be deer hair flared and and fanned over the over the top. The wings will be wonder wings. However, I've done it on a, with a lot of different kinds of wings. One of the things I was thinking about earlier today, and I have not tried, is wings with uh, CDC. So that might be something. In fact, I just had a thought just now. I might be able to take the spun hair head off and put a CDC head on. No, another another way of playing with it. Though it wouldn't be a muddle may anymore. And the body is dubbing, and the deer. The head is deer hair spun and trimmed. And let's um, let's get back here and take a look at the um, materials area. And um, using my pointer just to point everything out, um, I use static guard as always. So there it is. We're going to talk about this other stuff here in just a minute. Deer hair, uh, moose, my hair stacker. No, it's not for sale. I, every time I show my hair stackers, somebody tries to buy the darn things, and it's not for sale. And thread, wax, dubbing, and a couple of feathers uh, waiting to become wings. And as I say, there's the roadmap fly. But anyway, as you got a fly with, um, with a spun head, and in fact, the 18 here, I've tied these down to 22s. But I gotta, I'm going to tell you right up front, the smallest head that I can spin is an 18 and that's that one right there i spun that one earlier today and uh, quite frankly i struggled with it i'm not quite as my fingers are not quite as nimble as they were a few years ago but anyway uh, and when i uh, tie them in sizes 20 and 22 uh, i flare the head in place and then just trim it they look they look the same but there's just not quite enough room on a size 20 to spin the muddler type head now one of the things about this fly it looks like and in looking at it, like the wings are right out of the hackle, and in the tail is pretty sparse, it's extra long. All of these things have, have come about uh, through trial and error and so forth. And, and let me explain to you how this actually came about. Back in the good old days, when we didn't have but maybe a thousand Hoffman capes a year, uh, Getting hackle was a real problem. Getting grizzly hackle was next to impossible. Now Frank Johnson is a fellow that was with this organ with uh, the uh, Fly Fishers International Fly, Fly Federation of Fly Fishers for many years. Good friend, and we often bought hackle from India, and we get together from time to time to clean the hackle once it would it arrive, and then split up the goods. And I would have lots of India capes, but it was really a bear getting any hackle much smaller than a sixteen. And that would be sometimes it would take three or four feathers to tie one fly uh, because of the shortness of the feathers. Well, back in the day, I, I finally made connections with a guy in Plains, Montana. His name was Hugh Spencer. And he had a, a small uh, farm and he raised about 100 birds a year, just more or less as a hobby. Fly fisher that let his need for feathers kind of run away from him. Anyway, uh, I used to fish over in that area all, all the time and ran into him in a restaurant in Plains, Montana. 
got to be friends. And anyway, I contracted with him to get his hackle. Well, I'll tell you what. So I tie flies for a good portion of the winter, putting no hackle on the on the flies. So, as an example, uh, this particular fly came from an Adams, and I had a stack of a whole bunch of Adams that was slated to go to a fly shop in a couple of months with no hackle on them. The wings, tail, body, everything was there, but no grizzly and brown hackle. And I was just every year I would sweat bullets that I'd get my hackle in time to beat my commitments to my customers, and one day, a friend of mine was sitting having coffee, and and while I was tying up these bodies, and he says, "You know, Al, you ought to put a muddler head on that thing. Then you wouldn't have to worry about the hackle." Well, one thing led to another, and we did. So we just took an Adam's body that was laying there on my tying desk, and spun a muddler head on it with the with the collar, and took it out and and fished it. Uh, uh, several weeks later, it didn't land on the water real well. It wasn't balanced the way it needed to, it landed on its nose pretty bad. But so we started looking at the design of the fly and what came from that original Adams uh, evolved over the next 10 years. And we'll go into it right now. And I'll explain as I go along just what we're doing and why we're doing it. Because every, uh, every part of this fly has a, the material has a reason why, why it's positioned where it is and what its purpose is besides uh, pooling fish, it also has to, to serve functions of balancing the fly. Because like I said, one of the problems that I ran into is the doggone flies, when I just tied a muddler head on an Adam's body, uh, is that the, most, the fly would most often land on the water on its nose. And that was because there was an awful lot of material towards the front of the hook, not very much towards the back. Well, so the first thing I did is what I'm going to do right now on, on the tail. I'm going to slip over here, and first I'll grab my stacker and set that over at the tying area. And I'm going to get in here and get some of this moose. And I don't need a lot of moose because I want a sparse tail. But one of the things, if I reduce the number of fibers in my tail, one of the things that I'm going to have to do let me get over here at the crash bin and get the waste cleaned out. One of the things that I'm going to have to do is to make the tail longer to compensate for the fact that there's less numbers of fibers in that tail to balance the fly. So that's, that's what I did. The first thing I did is made the tail longer. Let me get this ready to stack. And then we'll uh, tie on a tail. And yes, and I've tried hackle fiber tails. And to be very honest with you, that works even, does, doesn't even do as good a job as the moose because it's lighter in weight. And no matter how long I made the tails, didn't seem to help any in uh, balancing the fly. But you, you'll see as things went along that, anyway, normally uh, a moose tail is as long as, the, as the, the shank of the hook. Well, this one, I'm making it, uh, well, it's uh, probably a hook and a quarter. So I'll just tie it on there. Wrapping back towards the bend of the hook and coming back. So I got my moose tail in place. And as you can see, that's quite a bit longer. So not only it has a little bit more weight and it has a little bit more leverage on the front end of the hook because of the, uh, the fulcrum action, if you will, lever leverage action of the longer material there. But anyway, let's trim off this waste. And now we're gonna come forward to our starting point, which was right at the one quarter point. Actually, what, you know, you know that on our dry flies, we normally reserve the front one third uh, for the wings and the hackle. Well, you can see that this hackle is placed all in one spot uh, rather than spread out like a hackle is on a, on a regular wrapped sort of a hackle. Now I am going to go back over to my materials and get this deer out. Now I've many times talked to you about deer hair and elk hair. Uh, their properties are the same and where they're located on the animal is the same, but um, the 
coloring is not always the same from one to the other. In fact, here's a, a picture of a, of a deer hide, and there's an elk hide. You can see that they, got a, they both have a dark strip down the backbone, and that's where the good wing and tail material comes from. Um, or the or hair wing flies like a, a wolf or a humpy. One of the things that I discovered, I tried to use that kind of hair right off of the backbone. It was too stiff for what I wanted it to do. So instead of taking hair along the backbone, like I did here, I have to move down into the top rib area, close to the backbone, not close to the belly, but closest to the backbone. That's what this is right here. Is It's got some nice light gray hair along here that will flare and spin, but it's still out on the tips. It's got some that uh, will flare some uh, more than on the backbone, but yet it, I call it in-between in hair, and I don't know what else to, to call it. It's, uh, I'll, and I'll get some out here. I'll get a bundle out to... It's a little bit crooked, so I'm going to take some crimps and put in that just to straighten out that, that curve in the, in the, hat, in the hair. And now I'm going to slip back over to the waist bin on my way back to the vise. And uh, clean out the trash. All right, that looks pretty good. <clears throat> and get over here. And just put this in the stacker to stack. Now, now one of the things that we often do when tying our hair wing flies is we talk about layer one, layer two, and all of that stuff because layers one and two have different properties than layers three and four. Well, one of the things in this fly, because we want the hair to flare, we don't really care about layers three and four and all that stuff. We're going to put it on and flare it anyway, whether it's one, two, three, or four. So all you want to do is get rid of the short stuff and the trash. And I'll just uh, take this out of the stacker after getting the... The, the fibers all lined up. <clears throat> and how much do I want in my hackle? The bundle. Well, first, I got a bad one right here. I need to get rid of. There, it's gone. Good. What we do is we take and just hold this and press it and see if the bundle is about the same as, as in width as the gap of the hook. And that's just about what we want right there. So that's perfect. If it was more, I'd um, I'd get rid of some. And if it was less, I'd have to add to it. But anyway, the length that I want this to be, another bad hair right there. There we go. It's gone. The length that I want this hackle to be is about as long as a complete hook. So I'm going to measure it for length, set it in place, and bind it right on top of the hook, right there. With several really tight wraps. Now I'm going to pull the waist up, and I want to cut that at a really severe angle. So that I can spread out those fibers and, and make a nice taper to my body. Now, one of the things about wrapping over those trimmed ends, let me zoom in just a little bit. You see these, trim, these trimmed ends right here? I'll guarantee you, you're a better person than I am if you can wrap over that and capture all of them without little stickies poking up and coming up through just like right there. Darn things. Now, I don't know if I can get those back under control or not, but one of the things that I have learned is I can kind of keep them pretty well under control if I take my fingers and hold them right on top of those ends, and you can just barely see the place where I'm going to wrap the thread as you look past the thumbnail. Well, what I'm doing is allowing the thumbnail to guide that thread in there, and I'm, every time I turn the thread, I slide my finger back just a little bit. As I wrap back over that, I'm capturing all those trimmed ends so that I end up with a nicely tapered underbody without any of the stickies showing up. And you know what I mean by the stickies, the little fibers that 
end up showing up through the body that you didn't want. So now that gives us the opportunity right there to uh, get a pretty smooth underbody. All right. <clears throat> now, let's see if I've got enough room up front here. I didn't mess up. Oh, I think I'll be all right. Enough room there to spin ahead. <clears throat> okay. Now we're coming to the wing. And this is where it was took me the better part of 10 years to get things just the way I wanted it. And that will start back over here with the materials. And I've just got two uh, pin cape feathers from the big end of the cape. And in fact, I want you to notice that they're different in lengths. One of the things about a wonder wing, as long as the fibers are long enough to do the job, uh, you don't make any difference whether one feather is bigger than the other feather, as long as the stem that we use in the middle of the uh, application is about the same uh, heaviness or same dimension. So let me just take and, and get rid of some waste right here. I'll just cut that off. And I'll cut this one off a bit. And we'll just take them over to the to the vice right now and see what do I have to do to, to pair them up. Because what I have here is a shorter one. There we go. In fact, I'd be better going to the offside camera. I've got a shorter one and a longer one. And I'm just going to put them together. Now, the butt ends look to me like the bigger feather, of course, has got a, fat, a fatter shaft right here. So I'm going to get rid of some of that. All right. That looks pretty good. Uh, we're just going to put those so they oppose each other just like that and get ready to form our wings. <clears throat> One of the things that's really important is that I get the, those two ends, the butt ends close. They gotta be right tight with each other or I'll get a, an, uh, an uneven set of wings. One side will be bulkier than the other. And now I'm just gonna pull those fibers back. And that's what the wings will be, but I need to first do a better job of dividing them. And I find that a bodkin works really good for that. That way I can divide the fibers top and bottom of the... Now, let's see. Do we have a... Yep. That's a good one. Now, I want you to notice that I have probably less fibers in these wings than I would in a wing that would be just a straight wonder wing with a wrapped hackle application. That's because I'm trying to reduce some of the bulk up front. And I want you to also notice where my thread is hanging. It's hanging right here, not right at the base of the hackle, but it's back from it. And that's one of the things that I had to learn is I had to place my wing back away from the hackle, even when it, I thought it would have to be right next to the hackle. Well, that didn't work. It has to be back away from it, so I redistribute the weight of the materials on the hook and so that the fly would land on the water right. And I'm just going to pull this out to length. And I like this to be just a little bit longer than, than, than a typical Wonder Wing application would be. And I'll just, again, trim the waist. And bring my fingers together and guide that feather or the thread in, in there so I don't have any sticky showing up. Now, I want you to notice that I have, the wing is not up where by the hackle where you think it would be. When you get the fly done, in fact, let me show you the fly. That looks like the wing is right there by the hackle. And the truth of the matter is it's not at all. It is, um, uh, it's back away from it. And what that does is reposition the weight of that wing material along with the extended length of the tail that will make the, that will compensate for the extra weight up front so that you end up with a fly that lands on the water right. I know it sounds like getting into the weeds and that's just what I had to do to get the design the way I wanted it. And that's about how much space that I want to leave between the wing and the hackle. And I'll just wrap some thread right in there. 
All right, now let's just get rid of this waste. Uh, it's not waste now, folks. You know that. It's um, actually, it's the next fly. Uh, I'll get my clip. One of the things that you don't want to do when you're when you start doing wonder wings, always put the those those feathers back into a clip so that those end the butt ends are even so you're ready to do the next fly. And I've got a, a errant fiber here, and that's what tweezers are for. All right. <clears throat> and let's see how these wings are setting. Now it's like we're well, we're doing pretty good. I'll just Stretch them a little bit this way and that way. So now it's time to put on the dove body. <clears throat> and I'll get out my uh, dubbing wax. Turn the cap upside down and put it down on the table so that I will remember to put my wax back into the cap. Too easy to uh, drop the wax into the waste bin and i uh, believe me this wax is sticky it's there it's that way for a reason and it can sure make a mess if you drop it into your waste bin anyway back over at the materials let me grab the dubbing i'm just using some soft touch dubbing tonight and uh, <clears throat> pull the uh, a bundle of it out of the packet and i think i'll just uh, Hold this back like this and touch my dubbing to the thread. Just um, let that wax grab a layer of dubbing so that we can go ahead and twist it in one direction only. Uh, and what is that direction? Well, clockwise or counterclockwise. I've had arguments from people on, on both. And the truth of the matter is, it probably doesn't make any difference. When I learned, I learned from a book written by a guy by the name of Lacey G. Uh, from the Herders Company, when I, where I got my original fly tying kit. And he said, wrap in one direction only. Well, I wrap, I, for a lot of years, I wrapped uh, counterclockwise and managed to survive, even though I had to keep tightening my, hat, my, my dubbing all the time. Um, and then... Uh, somewhere along the line, about 20 years ago, I uh, learned that clockwise is a better way, and I finally broke a bad habit of going the going the wrong direction. And uh, it now my my dubbing doesn't come loose anymore. I can't understand how that would be. Joke, guys, joke. Okay, now what I'm going to do is now we're at a point where some of our materials are going to have to do more than one job, just like we've done all along. The wings are the wings for the fly, but they're positioned so that they help balance the whole thing. And I'm going to push my tackle fibers back, pull the thread forward and wrap a small cone of thread in front of and tight against that hackle. I'm really building that up, but I don't want that cone of thread to come too far forward. See how I got that shape back pretty well? And I... But let me zoom in here. You still see I have quite a bit of bare hook right here. And that's what I'm going to do is I'm going to ease my thread forward right there. <clears throat> and that's where I'm going to make my first spin. And let's just back away from that. And let's go back over to the uh, materials. And I'll get a, a bundle of this uh, deer hair. And... I don't even need to um, stack it, but I do need to get rid of the trash because, but I'll be using this end right here where it's nice and light gray. And that means that it's um, more porous and it will flare and spin a lot better. But let me just hop over to the waste bin on my way back to the vise and clean out the, f the fuzz and the fluff and come back over here. And now we're ready to spin this around the hook. Now, I, thought I did only two turns. Three turns is what you want. I want you to notice that I'm pulling this off to the side, and I'm going to cut this off. 
Now, I absolutely guarantee you if I pull straight down on this thread, I'm going to lose it and it's going to come off over the hook eye. If, on the other hand, I'm going to have to do it, if I pull in this direction here towards the back, pulling back while I spin the hair like that, it will spin in that very narrow area right there, allowing me to apply the spun head. And now I'm going to bring my thread forward to tie off. And now remember that cone of thread there that was standing up the hackle? It serves another very important function right now. But first, let me... Uh, Finish off the fly before we before we trim it. And I'll do a whip finish now. And another. And I'll take my scissors and just use the edge to cut that off. Set that aside. And now let's just kind of dress all these hairs forward. You can see right back in here, let's see, maybe, let's see if I can bring that up so you can see it. Uh, you can see the short ones that I cut off there as compared to the, the longer ones that are towards the front. So, and then of course we've got our hackle right here. Anyway, I'm gonna start on the bottom and I'm just gonna trim this flat. And now I'm just going to tip my scissors slightly and start trimming as I rotate the vise. And remember, we're going to talk about that cone of thread not only standing up the hackle, but serving another function here in just a, in just a few minutes. Okay, let me see if I can turn this so you can better see what I'm talking about. Okay, right there. Okay, let's... All right. Right there, we've got some hair we have to get rid of. And remember that uh, that cone that we talked about? Well, that's still under the hair, and the hair was actually spun in front. So what I have learned, the easiest way to trim this and not cut my hackle is to lay the scissors in flat, and I'm going to exaggerate the point and then pull back and not actually do it. But you put the scissors in flat, push down, and push the scissor points down like that. And those scissor points are crossing over the cone of thread, not up against the hackle. If you just keep it straight like this, you're going to be cutting your hackle off too. So anyway, now that I've thoroughly confused you, let me just get over here and start pressing down, tips down, working my way around. I wonder if you can see, can you, John, can they see that when I'm got my thumb up there trimming it? Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. All right. There's one that needs to be trimmed and I'm pushing down with its scissor points. I got, I still got one of the hackles, but we'll back off just a little bit. Okay. Thought I saw a bad one in there somewhere. Where? Oh, there it is. Couldn't see it before. All right. <clears throat> Looks like we're good to go. And there you've seen a muddle may. In my, in my fly box, it's the best mayfly imitation you can fish. But it's not my number one mayfly imitation. The dirty rat is, and I've already told you about that back when, that, and the reason the dirty rat is my favorite is because I tie this one. I slowed down a little bit for you all to see, but it takes me about 10 minutes to tie one of these. And I can tie a half a dozen dirty rats in the same amount of time. So 
You figure out which one I'm going to probably go fishing with. I'll catch the same number of fish on a dirty rat or a muddle mate. But I tell you what, uh, I have sure sold a lot of these to people that, that like to uh, like to fish them. It's a great, great mayfly gun. And the one thing about it, let, let's go back to this. The thing about it that, that I like so much, I talk about this all the time, is the profile that we're looking for. And um, let's see if hair I missed there. I, have, I can see hairs I missed there all night. But it's got a good profile. And that's what the fish see is that is that profile when it's set, setting up on the water. But do we have questions? That's a beautiful tie, Al. Uh, thank you. Uh, I see one in the chat. It says, is that yearling? Are you talking about the hair? Yeah, the deer hair. It looked long. So I was wondering if it was yearling. Deer. Uh, it's the right color and texture that I wanted. And I bought the whole hide at the time. And it looked to me to be an, to be an adult, and, uh, and that's what I can tell you. If it's yearling, I don't know. It's it sure didn't look like a yearling, and like I said, I bought the whole hide. Hey Al, this is Jerry. What what colors do you tie the body in besides that? What colors do may do mayflies appear in? Oh, okay, the olives and okay. It, all this is G Jerry is it is a concept fly. It yeah, floats okay. good. But yet it has the profile for spring creeks, and you make it the size and the uh, and the color you want. And then and as an example, uh, yeah, the moose tail is beautiful. That's oh, well, there's a there's one that I tied this afternoon. There's a twelve, and then there's one you'd probably go fishing with quite a bit. It's an eighteen. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Al. Aaron wanted to know if you use different colored wings. Um, I, I do, but most of the time I like, I just love, I got a love affair with Grizzly, but so I do them very often. However, I do an awful lot of them with Dunn too. And, you know, Dunn and various colors of Dunn will match a whole lot of different um, um, insects, you know. In fact, the color Dunn, I wonder if it was named Dunn because of the Dunn colored mayfly wings. I don't know. Anyway, they're a gray color. And I think it was Jim Ferguson and Kathy Hamilton, if I remember right, who turned me on to this stuff. But it's called Thread Magic. And I've been working on the irrigation system. And, well, there's what the end of my fingers look like. I guarantee you thread, everything snags on that. And I'm getting the irrigation system ready for the, for the, for the season. And... Uh, if it wasn't for Thread Magic, uh, what that stuff does is it takes those beat up old hands there that you just saw. You just take and rub your your fingers over that fingertips, and it's so glassy smooth you can't believe it. And uh, I think that's from the sewing industry or the needlepoint industry or whatever. But it's as far as I'm concerned, they made it for fly tires. Anyway, so you get that on Amazon. I think it's about ten bucks. Well, I've been looking. I've been looking forward to this ever since I communicated with Gary Bagley, and we're going to be going into the weekly tip. And yeah, Gary Bigley, Bagley is going to be talking to us about tri tips, and it's not barbecue. And I'm really wondering just what could this possibly be? Uh, okay, why don't you tell us about it, Gary? Okay, so so the tri part that I was talking about is I got three little tips. He he me he emailed me at the beginning of the week and asked me if I'd do the tip. I thought, well, sure, I'll do the tip. Then reality set in. I thought, what the heck am I going to do? So the answer I didn't find right under my nose, so to speak, but it was on my tying desk. I got, I'm going to share three things that I do just about every time I tie, and uh, hopefully some of you will uh, will be able to utilize them. We're going to switch cameras over here. And the first thing... This is a little quick little homemade thing. It's a popsicle stick or craft stick. Craft stick. I've got uh, a small piece of magnet glued on the one end, Velcro on the other, the, the hook end of Velcro, so I can use that to rough up dubbing. And this, this little thin strip of magnet is so weak as far as a magnet goes, I can put that into a bag of hooks and just pull out one or maybe two, not 16, which is becomes very, very handy. So that's the first tip. Oh, yeah. One other thing, the uh, Velcro part, this this is so 
thin, I can get in under the hook, into the hook gap and um, rough up dubbing underneath on, small, on fairly small hooks. Um, tip two, close pins, miniature close pins. I've seen Al, we, we've all seen Al and Gretchen use uh, little metal clips and probably some of you do as well. This is just an alternative. And I just got finished demonstrating a scud pattern. And the way I lay things out when I'm going to do a demo is like so. Just put them in the uh, close pins. There's the hook with weight already on it. There's my rib material and scud back I used and some dubbing. Um, I found a long time ago if I put some dubbing in a close pin, when I come back to get it after I've laid it down, it didn't disappear. It stayed there. And I used some cockbellion for the uh, for the antenna on the scud. And of course, this I use something similar. Well, actually, the same thing. I just put a lot more material in if I'm going to tie a dozen of them from a box, for example. All right. Number tip number three. That is a spool hand. I don't know if any of you have heard of them. Probably some of you have. What this is, it's a very handy tool. Some elastic. There's a bead inside here. Now you can see the, the hole in the center of the bead. And what this goes on is our spools, the one-inch spool materials that we use, like wire, for example. And, of course, the material goes up through the hole in the bead and stretch the elastic around it. And I can pull this out. If I end up with more than I wanted, I can just roll it back in. And that keeps my, st my spooled material all on the spool and not splaying out all over the place. And I've got the, I, can, I use it for lead or non-lead, either one. Um, tensils, Mylar tensile. This is a brand new one that I just opened up today for this demo. And of course they have the, material crammed down in between the this orange cap and and the spool and you all know probably what it does to the to the material like this instead of it being nice and smooth like we need it this this last part is just going to be un, unusable but you notice i can right, run it right back in and keeps things under control gary is that shrink tube around the bead i you know i don't know what it is um there, there doesn't seem to be a seam around it anywhere. And shrink tube is what first came to my mind. I, I really don't know um, what what he used. But if you're interested, there's there's the card. It's spool hands. I'll zip in a little bit here. If I can. There we go. It's spool, spool-hands.com. And if anybody knows Bob Sutherland, please tell him that he probably owes me a, a free pack of these things because I have advertised it so many times for him in the in the past. Okay, that's what I got, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Well, that's wonderful. And uh, do you have uh, any suggestions for us on how to make it, Kristen? And if you do... Well, I, I, I do. Um, so I go to the crafting store or Amazon, whichever you can, and buy a uh, quarter inch alphabet beads because they don't have any kind of seam on the interior of the bead. And then I hot glue the uh, quarter inch elastic to the bead. And then I put heat shrink around the outside to kind of help it stay on there. And I do make them in several different lengths. Um, I just made them because I wasn't willing to pay for them, <laughs> and they're they're not they're not hard to make. They're very easy. I I have them for my leader as well, um, but I make them in you know a, a, a little bit smaller when you've got the little smaller um, spools, and then I have some of the the larger. And if somebody wants to get with me separately, I'm on Facebook. I'm happy to show you what I've made. Uh, I know I gave Alan Gretchen some of those. So, yeah, very so, easy. Anyway, Sherry says that Uni sells them as well. Kristen, thank you so much for sharing that with us. Well, in fact, sharing is a good time as any to go into the sharing section. Okay, it's that time again, folks. 
Sharing on VT's Fly Tying Friday. This is when we turn to all of you for inspiration. That's from okay. last week. That's last week, yeah. That beautiful. Good job. Those are from last week, and here's the Wednesday. You can't really do that in white, but and this pretty, is why the muddler that you just did. Pretty the tough muddler. to do, yeah. <laughs> so, ah. yeah. Well, thank you. Thank You're you. You're welcome. Anyone else? Yeah, Al. Uh, I think uh, John Wright's got something, and I think Michael Paradis has got something, too. Anyway, John, what do we have from you? Okay, uh, I've always had problems with the wire coming undone and thread coming undone. And a friend of mine down in St. Louis came up with this idea. I don't know if you all know what these are. Yep. Yep, use them all yep. the time. Yeah. <laughs> Cut them off like so, and just wrap them around your spool. And this is only a three quarters, so it's uh, it's not going to fit quite as well as the, or the. This is only a quarter, but you get the idea. Yeah, and these hold just it up, hold it up in front of your face more because you're yeah, off camera. There we go. Now. You're there off we camera go. now. Oh, there it there is. There you go. There you go. Yep. And if you wanted to, you could punch a hole in that white spot right there and pull your thread through. So sure you could. Thank you, John. Just, yep. Okay, we'll give it a try. Worst thing will happen is it doesn't work. <clears throat> okay. Uh, okay. Well, Wednesday, uh, our regular fly tying class, we were doing uh, split thread dubbing loop, and a lot of people had trouble with it, and. This is just a little quick explanation of what I did. Okay, splitting thread. This may be a better way. I've got uh, UTC-70 thread. First thing to do is flatten the thread. So I'm going to spin my bobbin, bobbin holder counterclockwise. until I can see that the thread is flattened. And rather than try to stab that flattened thread up in the air, I'm going to put my thumbnail behind it and lay my bodkin down on top of the thread and I can move my bodkin back and forth to split the thread and there you go that is awesome oh my awesome. god awesome that is so good <laughs> that oh so i have one other comment it's not a, it's really not everybody probably knows this but sometimes it's a reminder you know if you don't want to buy a thousand colors of thread you just buy white and get some markers uh and the other thing with uh, the guys that tie Atlantics, you know, we basically have to have a white thread base for get, making the uh, floss pop. You know, it really helps to have a white base for floss. But uh, you know, you, you very seldom do you, you you can you can just get away with a, a marker and just cover up any any white thread on the head when you're done. You know those uh, long uh, clips that we're using to hold our materials with. You know, Correct. the um, model. Well, I found yeah. out that if you have a long piece of material hanging out in front of your hook, just attach that to it and attach and use it and hang it off your um, bobbin holder. And then it holds in place and holds it out of the way and doesn't fly around. Hmm. Interesting. Good tip. Yeah. Thank you. I've been working on cicadas, getting ready for this epic hatch we're going to have this year. Um, and started playing around with different foam products and found this foam clay on Amazon. It's a it's in a plastic bag to keep the moisture in. And you can make just about anything, poppers, but that's the cicada bodies I've been making. And that's the finished product. Mm. You can see you can get a, a nice shape. It takes about two days to dry and it dries hard. Uh, just like a foam, you can sand it, paint it as well. Wonderful. Really good so, product. 
Do you put it on a hook and then let it dry so you can sand it on the hook for a popper or something like that? Or I've actually been forming them and laying them out, and then I'll turn them over after one day to let the underside dry, and then attach them to the hook on the back end. Let me let me grab a pin and you hold that thing up again. But it dries really hard. You could cut it with a razor blade, sand it, however you want to do it. Hey, David, how well does that stuff float? It's just like foam. No I mean, kidding. it is very, very dense, very light. Um, it's like a closed cell foam. I do a lot of deer hair tying, and a lot of times I'll let off my bobbin when I've got it hanging. But I found this little kit. You can take a one-ounce lead egg sinker, Bore the hole out a little bit bigger, slide it over the end of your bobbin like that. And then if you let go of your bobbin, it keeps tension on your thread to keep the deer hair from loosening up while you're mm -hmm. doing something else. Then this here is what's called a boba straw. You get them for about eight dollars a hundred off yeah. Amazon. They're great to store flash or any yarn or anything like that. They're used for like some kind of drink straw, but they're about mm -hmm. a half inch in diameter. Hey, that's it for this week, folks. Thank you so much for joining us. Until next time, good tying, tight lines.